multiplies incredibly fast. Looking back at 30 years of HIV research, it's clear we've come a long way. The advent of new medications means those with HIV are living longer, healthier lives. In effect, what treatments mean is um, diagnosis does not equal death. Nowadays, many people think of AIDS as a third world disease, but in reality, it's right amongst us. We are seeing a resurgence in HIV. Um, I think younger people perhaps have a different relationship to HIV. They're growing up and some of them are careless like young people are. You can't scare them because they think uh, that the drugs will save them. HIV AIDS is still one of mankind's greatest scourges. It's still a terrifying diagnosis to get as a young man or woman that you're HIV infected. The holy grail of HIV research is to find a cure. With the imminent threat of drug resistance, doctors have a new weapon in their arsenal. These new types of medicine based on genetic manipulation of our cells, I think this is an exciting way to think about fighting HIV. I travel abroad and talk to scientists who are making medical history. And I meet the man who is living proof that a cure is possible. A deadly virus jumps from primates to humans. Meanwhile, the silent killer continues. It spreads around the world before we're even aware it exists. Acquired immune deficiency syndrome looms as the greatest health crisis to face this country in a generation. HIV AIDS would go on to become the worst pandemic of our time, infecting 70 million people and killing 35 million. You know, the big problem with HIV is it's not just your average virus that infects any cell in the body, it's a virus that specifically goes into your immune system and kills the very cells that are trying to attack it. That's why it's so insidious. HIV hones in on T lymphocytes, or T cells, our vital immune cells that help fight infections. It penetrates the T cells' defences and begins to replicate up to 10 billion copies a day. Eventually, the cell dies, releasing new clones of the virus, slowly killing off a person's immune system. Medications can stop the virus from replicating, but HIV is cunning. Oh my gosh, it's like the poster child for natural selection. It's always changing. If you treat patients with just one drug, for example, the virus just laughs at you and very rapidly evolves resistance to that one drug. This is why we have to treat patients with multiple drugs, typically a combination of three, to make it just statistically improbable for the virus to be able to simultaneously evolve resistance to all three drugs. HIV is able to lie dormant within cells for months or years. So that cell looks like a normal cell. The body's immune system can't tell that it's got any virus in it. But then down the line, something happens to that cell to kind of wake it up and wake up the HIV virus inside it. So that's why no matter how long a patient takes these drugs, we can never get rid of these very rare latently infected cells that are just primed to restart the infection. But new research holds promise of ending a patient's lifelong dependence on drugs. It was in Washington DC that I met Timothy Ray Brown, the only man in the world to be cured of HIV. It's amazing to be cured of HIV and I'm very happy about it. Did you believe it at first? No, I didn't believe it at first. What finally convinced you? Um, a medical journal was published, and I realized that all, a lot of other medical scientists believed it, and so then I started to believe it. But it took a while. Tim reflects back on how his cure came about. Living in Berlin at the time, his HIV was under control, until one day he began to feel unwell. After a battery of tests, his doctors said those dreaded words. He said, I have bad news for you. You have acute myeloid le leukemia. 
And I'm like, oh, crap. And uh, I was in shock. This type of leukemia is most likely to be a death sentence for HIV patients. He explained to me that there was a chance that they'd have to do a stem cell transplant. And at that point, I'm like, OK, I guess I'll have to go through this in order to live because the leukemia would have killed me like within a couple months. Tim wasn't to know that the bone marrow transplant he was about to receive would make him one of the most famous medical patients in history. It began with a discovery made by Professor Stephen O'Brien. Like he noticed that some people were more vulnerable to HIV infection than others. We knew that some people became infected easily, while other people were exposed many times and avoided it. Professor O'Brien searched for a genetic explanation for why some people were less likely to be infected with HIV. At that time, the human genetics industry was in its infancy. A decade after HIV, we were talking about sequencing the human genome, and AIDS had started to take tens of millions of people. The tools for studying these things were getting us to the stage that we were able to design strategies to see if we could discover natural genetic resistance. A breakthrough came with the discovery of a receptor on the surface of T cells called CCR5. HIV initially docks with the CD4 receptor, but then needs to bind to the CCR5 receptor to invade the cell. Remarkably, Professor O'Brien's lab discovered some people were born with a genetic defect resulting in a faulty CCR5 receptor. When the receptor is defective, the virus can't enter the cell. It was as if, if you had two copies of this mutation, the deletion that ruined CCR5, you never got infected with HIV. So this convinced us that CCR5 was necessary for infection. Professor O'Brien published these findings in 1996. Today, it's estimated about 1% of the Caucasian population has inherited this genetic defect and are naturally resistant to becoming infected with HIV. You, I, any people you know, watching the program can be CCR5 negative. You can get HIV in your body and it can't get into these cells. It's kind of, you know, it puts one foot on CD4 and the other foot kind of has nowhere to go. So people who are CCR5 negative are resistant to HIV. It was a fortunate coincidence that Timothy's doctor came across Professor O'Brien's paper while studying as a med student. He was fascinated by the idea of HIV resistance. I was so impressed from this research that I kept this information in my mind. And uh, 10 years later, when I saw the Timothy Brown patient, uh, I put one and one together and decided to make uh, this approach. Dr. Hooter hypothesized that if he could find a bone marrow donor that was not only a tissue match, but also had the mutation of the CCR5 gene, Timothy would have a shot at being cured of cancer as well as HIV. This procedure had never been done before, and the odds of finding the perfect donor were slim. But they had success. Timothy was infused with the donor cells and Dr. Hooter waited anxiously for the results. After 60 days, the testings for virus material went all negative and uh, stayed negative. So this was a time point probably where uh, the eradication happened. It was a very good moment. I'm sure I'll go down in history being the first patient that has been cured of HIV. Tim is now famously known as the Berlin patient. There are 34 million people in the world with HIV, and it's hard to believe that I'm the first person to be cured of HIV. It's hard to believe. It's not a general procedure that we can turn around and say, OK, all you HIV-infected people, we can do these bone marrow transplants. They require a lifelong immunosuppressive drugs. They have the risk of 
graft versus host reaction, which kills something between 25 and 30 percent of the people who receive these bone marrow transplants, and because it doesn't always work. So it's only a treatment of last resort. It's been several years since Tim had his treatment, and despite hundreds of blood tests and tissue biopsies, including in his brain, doctors have never been able to find a shred of HIV in his system. Now, researchers around the world are scrambling to develop a streamlined version of this therapy that's safe and accessible to everyone. Here in Los Angeles, researchers may have the answer in using one of the most sophisticated tools in genetic engineering. So the question is, can we take somebody who has CCR5 and genetically alter their cells so that they no longer have CCR5? And by doing that, can we make somebody's immune system now resistant to HIV so that they can fight back and, and start to stop this virus spreading in their body? To do this, her team used what they describe as molecular scissors, which cruise along the DNA until it finds the CCR5 gene. And I want to go into the DNA and basically make a cut in the middle of that CCR5 gene and just kind of mess it up so that it can no longer make the CCR5 protein. And if we introduce them into a patient's cells, they'll basically go in, they'll hunt around in the DNA, they'll find the CCR5 gene and they cut it, and in that way they destroy it. Matt Sharp was prepared to put his body on the line to trial this technology. As somebody who's been living with HIV and taking these medications for years, I mean, my concern uh, was really to improve this, the state of the art. How can we get beyond having to take medication for the rest of our lives? Matt was on medications, but for some reason, the virus always had the upper hand on his immune system, and his T cell count remained low. Most people that go on antiretroviral therapy, their T cells will start to climb and almost get to a normal level. Mine never have over the years. At the clinic, a nurse takes his blood to siphon off his T cells. It's a process that takes about three to four hours, um, and they take about a can of Coke's worth of T cells, which is harmless because your body creates T cells every day. Matt's T cells were sent to the lab. They destroyed the CCR5 gene and then sent them back to the clinic to be reinfused. You're only giving a patient a small amount of modified T cells compared to their actual, you know, immune system that's creating their normal T cells. Ideally, you know, we want a patient to have more of these modified T cells in their system so that their body has more of a chance to kind of fight the virus on its own. Even though Matt is still on his medications, he did see a resurgence of his T cells. My T cells were almost doubled, uh, really over a very short time. So and I had never seen that with any drug trial I'd been in before. And then over time, you know, over the over the several months and years, that that level stayed high, and so um, I knew I was having a good result. Yeah. Eventually, they hope that the patient's newly modified T cells will be able to keep the level of virus under control without the need for medication. Using modified T cells has its limits because they have a finite lifespan. Researchers needed something that would act like a constant reservoir for these cells, so they turned to the stem cell. The cool thing about stem cells is because they constantly make um, daughters that go on to grow up and some of them become T cells. If you go into an actual stem cell and make that CCR5 negative, you're gonna have a much bigger effect. They will continue, hopefully for the life of the patient, to keep making CCR5 negative progeny cells, including the T cells. So in that way, we can also increase the frequency. Professor Cannon was able to silence the CCR5 gene in the stem cells of mice. But these were no ordinary mice. This is where we keep our humanized mice, as we call them. So these mice are really special. I mean, they look just like regular white mice. 
but actually they have contained within them pretty much a whole human immune system. So this is necessary because HIV is a human virus and it mm -hmm. wouldn't infect mice? Yes, HIV doesn't normally infect mice. Half of the mice were transplanted with the newly modified stem cells and the other half weren't. It was actually really exciting to see because after about six weeks, the mice that had been modified to have lost some of the CCR5 protein, those mice started to control the HIV infection and it started to go down. And by about three months, we basically couldn't find any HIV left in those mice. So they, they really, they cured themselves of HIV. That's incredible. I mean, were you surprised by the results? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Excited? Yes, very much so. We didn't exactly break up Human the trials with modified stem cells are already underway in the US and Australia. In the meantime, controlling the spread of HIV is paramount. The key to that is widespread testing. Here in the US, you can actually buy HIV tests at your local pharmacy. The best thing about this is that you don't have to wait for lab tests. You can do it yourself and you can have the results in 20 minutes. Negative. In Australia, a resurgence of HIV is of concern to advocacy organisations like ACON. In New South Wales in 2012, we saw a 24% increase, 19% uh, in gay men, 24% across the board, and that resurgence happening in New South Wales is happening in most other Australian states and indeed most other developed countries throughout the world. It's thought to be because people no longer consider HIV a death sentence. That in three years, nearly 2,000 of us will be dead. In the mid-80s, Australia launched a series of fear campaigns. But if not stopped, it could kill more Australians than World War II. Some of the early campaigns uh, in response to HIV were based around fear and scaring people, and that fear perhaps at that time perhaps motivated some people to change their sexual practices. What they also did, though, was create a level of stigma and discrimination for HIV-positive people, uh, and that impact is still with us today. Remember, we took up the fight. We raised awareness. It's more important that we talk about the importance of staying safe, the importance of getting tested, and the importance of health benefits of treatment. So that's why our latest campaign, Ending HIV, really talks about those three elements. As many as 10,000 people with HIV don't know they're infected. At this city-based centre in Sydney, they've introduced the rapid HIV screening test. What that allows people to do is go in for a test um, and have their results within 30 minutes. It's free and it's as simple as going in and having the test done confidentially. Given that we know around 30% of people with HIV don't know that they're living with the virus, it's absolutely critical that people get tested so they know their status, so that they can take appropriate steps to modify their behaviour and also get the help, support and health care and treatment, if they're ready for it, that they need. Researchers are excited about the potential of these new gene therapies. But for now, HIV AIDS still remains a life-threatening disease. The cocktail of drugs places a huge burden on the patient's health and the economy. That's why the hope for a cure still burns bright. I would just love to see the place and the point in time where I can not have to take medications anymore and maybe just have, you know, find ways for my own body to control HIV without the medications. If we could get there, I, I would go to my grave happily, <laughs> I guess. I'm planning on coming here as much as possible to lobby Congress for more funding for H an HIV cure. Do you think it'll happen in your lifetime? Yes, I do think it's going to happen in my lifetime. Oh.